Let's pray. Lord, it's, it's important now that we focus. It's important now that we let all the stuff, Lord, the stuff that distracts us, Lord, the stuff of life, the things that we think are so important that have captivated our minds, we need to focus on what matters now, and that is the contemplation of what you have done for us, or the story of your wonderful gift, the gift of life brought to us by giving your life for us. Lord, I pray that as we study your word, Lord, that your, your Holy Spirit ministers more to us as we contemplate the word than, than I, this speaker, this fallible man, could ever do. I pray that there would be words spoken to us this morning that aren't even spoken from here. They're spoken from you, and they're spoken to our hearts as we contemplate your word, because that is where change must come. Lord, I pray that you're glorified by our remembrance. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We left off last where Peter has really dropped the ball. He's fallen asleep. Jesus told him to stay awake. But it's too late now. Jesus says in verse 46 of chapter 26, Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. He's at hand. He's here. Verse 47, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus said, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Judas Iscariot is the worst man who ever walked the earth. Sometimes we feel sorry for Judas. You know, when Jesus said earlier, I think in verse 24, the Son of Man goes as it is written to him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better if that man had never been born. It would be better if he'd never been born. I think that those words in our, idea, our sort of worldview, our American worldview, that's, that's sort of like one of those things you say about people who are undergoing a tragedy outside of their control. Man, I just life's been so hard for you. It'd just be better if you were never born. That's what people say before they end their own life, usually, in their own heart and mind. It'd be better if I was never born. But that's not exactly what Jesus meant when he said it'd be better if he was never born. He was, he was describing what Judas was. In John 6, he says, Did I not choose you to 12, and yet one of you is a devil? A devil? Judas's heart was so in line with his betrayal, was in so, so in line with Satan himself that Satan entered him right before he betrayed Christ. And I think that's so powerful because it's not as if Judas wouldn't have done it if he wasn't empowered by Satan. But that him and Satan were in such agreement. And Satan wanted so badly to do what Judas was about to do that he had to enter him and enjoy that with him. They found communion together there. They came together there. Judas experienced everything that the disciples experienced. He had given up everything, just like they had, to follow Jesus. Houses, lands, whatever. He'd given it up. He had seen the miracles. He saw Jesus calm the seas. He sat back 
and allow Jesus to wash his feet, knowing that as he's washing his feet, he's plotting in his head how he can destroy the man who's loving him. That's the kind of man that Judas Iscariot was. It says in John, Jesus says, that the scripture may be fulfilled, the one who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Has lifted up his heel against me. In Psalm 55, it's worth looking at. In Psalm 55, David says other things about people who have betrayed him. In Psalm 55, starting in verse 12, he says, For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in the throng. Let death steal over him. Let them go down to Sheol alive, for evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart. They didn't show their evil. It wasn't on their sleeve. It wasn't, they didn't tell anybody what their plots were. They kept their evil and their diabolical plans in their own heart and their own house. They kept it to themselves. Verse 20, my, my companion stretched out his hand against his friends. He violated his covenant. His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Jesus, when he quotes Psalm 41, that's David referring to Ahithophel, who betrayed King David and sided with King David's son, Absalom, when Absalom uh, rebelled against David. In Psalm 41, this is what David said. And that word, he has lifted up his heel against me, and we're like, what does that mean? Like, ah, that doesn't make any sense. But here's how it makes sense. That phrase, lifted up his heel against me, sort of encompasses just how terrible betrayal is. Just how calculated it is. You see, when an army was in camp, okay, and they were, they were, it was nighttime and it was time for the soldiers to sleep, they would, set, they would set up guards and people would have normal watches, but where were they watching? They were watching outside the camp to make sure that no one raided. They would wake everybody up if, if the army started coming in. But an enemy within has to work very hard at gaining the trust of the leader of the army, whether it be a captain or the king, so that he is sleeping close to him. He is trusted. He was a trusted counselor to the king. If the king has people around him that he trusts, captains have people around them that they trust to keep them safe. And he gains trustworthy access and finally, when the moment is right in the dead of night, he is able to get up, walk up to the captain, lift up his heel, and crush his neck. You see, very little effort had to be done if you are a betraying person. When the moment came, there was no fight. In cowardice, you could set up a situation where you could make it easier on yourself to betray. And you could make, do maximal damage. And then you could run to the enemy for safety. That's not honorable. We know that. You remember the story of King David when uh, Saul and Jonathan died at battle and Saul fell on his own sword? Remember there was a, a, an Amalekite who was there. Young boy. He saw Saul kill himself, but he was to David. And what does he say? I put Saul out of his misery for you. Because he thought that David would be pleased by him killing Saul. But David wasn't pleased with that. He said, uh, what makes you think you could raise your hand against God's anointed? Why is he still walking around? Somebody kill him. They put him to death. It's not honorable to kill someone in, their, in a time of vulnerability. So when Jesus says he's lifted up his heel against him, we see that as the picture. Yet Judas... Betrayal was so perfect that he didn't even have to strike a blow. 
he gave a kiss. And he allowed everybody else to come and take Jesus. You see how terrible that is? You feel sorry for Judas? Don't feel sorry for Judas. To feel sorry for Judas is the same as feeling sorry for the guy who drove the spikes into Jesus' hands or scourged Jesus or feel sorry for those who punched him in the face. You feel sorry for those guys? No. Judas is the most despised man who ever walked the earth. Terrible. Malicious. Terrible man. The worst. And yet, we're not here to exalt Judas. And we're not here to talk about how bad Judas is for the sake of talking about how bad Judas is. But Judas' evil, his wickedness, is going to be used as a dark background to highlight the brilliant light of our Lord. Because even though Judas had done the worst thing imaginable, he had betrayed the Son of God. How does the Son of God react? He calls him friend. He calls him friend. And then we're reminded. Jesus says, I didn't come to condemn the world, but that through me the world might be saved. Judas was already condemned. Jesus did not come to avenge himself. We're reminded of that. We're reminded of that. Jesus was walking in his own words. Jesus wasn't going to contradict himself because he was super mad. He didn't spit in Judas' face. He didn't even give him a dirty look. He called, said, friend, do what you come here to do. He even gives Judas the, the benefit of shock. In Luke 22, he says, you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Jesus is surprised. You betray him with a kiss? Unmoved. Keep that in mind. Okay? Jesus did not, when he underwent the scorn of men, he underwent it in the worst possible way. And I'm not going to say that we should look at this like an example, because I think it's deeper than that. Because we will be betrayed. Paul was betrayed. And yet again, Paul did not hold it against him. Alexander the coppersmith, at the end of 2 Timothy, right? He did him much harm. But God is his judge. God is his judge. It says in Romans 12, we don't repay evil for evil, do we? What's this say? Luke or Romans chapter 12. Let's take a look at this. You've read it before, but I like to do this. We're not just trying to get through some doctrine here. We want to kind of revel in this. We want to let these words minister to our heart and our mind. Romans 12, this is verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Isn't that what Jesus did? Friend. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay, repay no evil, no one evil for evil. But give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all, if possible. So as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For so by doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Jesus exemplified that. To give Judas any sort of pity, for what he did it means that we're sort of removing the pain of that betrayal from Christ as if it wasn't as bad but it really was as bad as it appeared to be Jesus will be rejected by his own disciples 
by his own people and by the Gentile world. Everyone will have their chance to flee from him, to reject him, to not stand with him. But if you've ever been betrayed, there's a t-shirt I used to see, and on the back of it said, you've probably heard this phrase before, I don't get mad, I get even, right? I don't get mad, I get even. Somebody does something wrong to you, they say, hey, I'm really sorry about that. It's like, hey, I wasn't mad, but you're going to get yours. I get even. Christians don't get even. We don't get even. You know why? Because we're like Jesus. When we're betrayed, it doesn't change the course of what we're doing. It doesn't even change our opinion of the one who betrayed us. It doesn't hurt. Of course it hurts. But with the grace of God, we can continue on doing exactly what the Lord will have us to do. Some people are betrayed, and they react by that betrayal by leaving the church. Someone betrays them within the body, and they're like, well, I give up on Christianity. I'm done. That's the way Christians are. I'm out of here. No, betrayal can be expected. It's one of those things that we can expect because that's what Jesus underwent. Jesus underwent betrayal. We will undergo betrayal. But how we react to that demonstrates whether we are actually disciples of Jesus Christ or not. Peter reacted in a certain way, right? It says here that as they laid hands on him, behold, verse 51, all this happens very quickly, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? We know from other gospels that this was Peter. All this is going down. And we know in the book of John that when they walked and he said, who do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he. And everybody gets knocked down on their can. That's a good way to stop a mob from acting too quickly. Can you imagine? They're all coming. They're going to get him. Whoosh. Okay, they're going to get up and think a little before they come in too quick. And then after seeing him get knocked down, Peter, Peter grabs a sword and starts hacking away. Right? No, Peter. I don't need the fisherman with the brand new sword to defend me. Did Jesus teach them how to use a sword? No, there were no combat classes. What are you doing? You see, it says in Galatians 6, that whatever you sow to the flesh, your own flesh, you will reap from the flesh corruption. If you sow into the Spirit, you sow to the Spirit, you will reap life. Jesus told Peter, watch and pray so you don't fall into temptation. Peter slept. He sowed to his own flesh. So, of course, the reaction was carnal, was fleshly. Was he trying to do good? Sure, he was trying to do good. Was he going with his gut? Absolutely. So, believers, what have we learned from Peter? Don't go with your gut. Go with the Spirit. It's really easy to get in the way of what God's actually doing by going with your gut, your gut in a habit of avoiding prayer and just sort of acting, jumping in there, helping, giving some wisdom, right? Jesus doesn't need you like that. He doesn't need anything. Peter, I could have asked my father in heaven to sell down thousands of angels in this moment, and I'm not doing that. What are you doing? Stop it. You feel like you're really trying hard for the Lord and nobody else seems to get what you're doing. It's so important. Stop. 
God does not need any one of us, any of our skill. God isn't waiting on our talent in order to accomplish what he's doing. He doesn't need your talent. He doesn't need any of that stuff, any more than he needs a, the swordsmanship of a fisherman. It's useless to him. It says in 2 Corinthians 10, that our, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So God is the might. God is the power. Grace is the power. Not me. Not my intelligence. God doesn't want your expertise. God wants you to be a disciple. He wants you to do what he taught you to do. What did he teach him to do? Matthew 5. Let's take a look at it. It's been a little while since we've been there. About a year. He says here, Verse 38 of chapter 5, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, right? Get even. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who borrows from you. You know what that sounds like? It sounds like Jesus wants me to be a doormat. People don't like that person. It offends my pride. It offends my honor. But if you're in Christ, you died to that. You died to you. Christ wants you to be worse than a doormat. He wants you to be a dead guy. A doormat, in that instance, is still like kind of trying to retain its own honor and getting stepped on. But when you're dead, you've died to yourself, you've got no pride to defend. Wow, that, that's amazing. It would take a supernatural change in us, wouldn't it, to be able to behave that way. It does. It's called being born again and walking in the Spirit. That's what makes us so darn peculiar to people. It makes us peculiar. Jesus isn't calling us to do anything he hasn't done already. He did it. He championed it. He championed it so that we can do it too. Get this. Jesus didn't take or suffer anything that he doesn't expect his believers to also suffer. Oftentimes, have you ever heard this said? Jesus went to the cross so that I didn't have to. Jesus took those nails so I didn't have to. Not true. Jesus actually said, if anyone's going to come after me, they have to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. So Jesus didn't actually substitute suffering for you and me. What did he do? What did he take that we could not take? The wrath of God. That's what Jesus took. The wrath of God for your sin and for mine. I could not take that. And if I did, I would deserve it. But I'm not valuable enough, it says in Psalm 49. What would it take to ransom another man's life? It's too pricey for another man to do. It says that in Psalm 49. So God himself had to take, be the ransom. He had to be the life giver. His precious blood had to be the purchase price for me. But when Jesus says in John 17, I'm leaving them to what? To do my work. To do everything that I was doing. So as believers, we actually... Reflect Jesus by acting like Jesus. We don't get to have a free hall pass to do whatever we want because of what he did. You're missing the point. If you think that becoming a Christian means that your life gets better. Life doesn't get better. Your life ended. Your life ended. He who ever would lose his life for my sake will find it. But whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. If I have lost my life for Christ, 
I get to enjoy the grace of God and a born-again relationship with the Father so that when people keep persecuting me and I go through all these terrible things, I just have this joy because I have received eternal life. I'm enjoying the life that God gives through all these things. I don't walk around like a martyr, so sad. It's my lot to bear. I've got to be sorrowful. I've got to get beat up. No. No, we, we get to enjoy the life of God. We were, we were buried with him, and now we are risen with him, walking in a new nature. And when people see that, they see the life of Christ. Christ was so peculiar to people. He was peculiar even to Judas. I, I really think, my opinion, Sam's opinion, that that word friend is the thing that haunted Judas the most. That when he came to betray him, he thought Jesus would give him the shocked look of anger. And he didn't. So that when he's accused, he later will say what? Take your money back. I have betrayed an innocent man. An innocent man. A good man. It's too late. It's too late. It was too late for him to save Jesus, but it wasn't too late for him to be saved. But because Judas has the type of nature that Judas does, Judas is all about Judas. And so Judas would take judgment into his own hands. And we'll see that later. We'll talk about that later on. That's a good point. That's a good thing to talk about. Jesus never taught these guys to fight. Judas was acting, or I'm sorry, Peter was acting on autopilot. Not good. Don't do that. Jesus first shows us an example of reproof. Reproof is just basically saying, I don't agree with what you're doing. Stop what you're doing. This is not good. Put your sword away. Then rebuke. All who live by the sword are going to die by the sword. I taught you how to live by the word of life. Not by the sword. You want to live by the sword, that's how you're going to die. And lastly, this is pointless. This is futile, what you're doing. It's silly. You're actually going against what I told you to. I told you already, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, when you wanted to keep me from the cross. And now you're trying to keep me from the cross again. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, and this is amazing, he starts preaching to the mob. Mobs don't generally like to be preached at. I've seen mobs, right? See them on TV? They're unreasonable. Mobs are unreasonable. They just get hyped up, and they get more crazy, and then crazy stuff starts happening, and no one can control mobs. Jesus can. His wisdom, his power, how do you control a mob? You set every one of them on their butt at once. And they get up. And then one of them gets their ear hacked off by one of your disciples. You say, hey, quit. You pick up the ear and you put it back on that guy. Okay? Everyone's a little confused at this point. Everyone's a little confused. They're a little blown away. They don't know who's in charge anymore. They thought they were in charge. And now it sounds like Jesus is in charge, because now he's going to give a speech. Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching and did not seize me. But this has taken place so the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And Luke, he says, your, your hour has come. It's time of darkness. This is your hour. This is your hour in the time of darkness, what he says in Luke. This is your time. You're only here and you're only doing what you're doing because I want you to. So they seize him and the disciples fled. It was right for them to flee. When we see him flee, I think we're easy to, it's easy for us to say, oh, these cowards. But it was actually good. And Jesus wanted them to flee. He already told them, we'll strike the shepherd and the sheep will flee. Right? He wanted them to flee. He wanted them to be safe. It was important for him to keep all of his disciples except for the one, the son of perdition. 
That's the one he wouldn't keep. But even Judas, he remained, he kept safe. The only one that killed Judas was Judas. They all fled. They all ran. And they should have. They got to step back. Jesus can't protect them anymore. Jesus, under divine power, protecting his disciples by the Father, would no longer be able to protect them by God's hand because Jesus was about to receive the wrath of God on their behalf, on our behalf. Jesus, where he went now, he had to go alone. So they flee. And as we'll talk about next week, Jesus is going to go to a council. And what Jesus is going to experience next is a circus of blasphemy, lies, deception. The whole trial was illegal. Jesus is going to go experience that. Not so that we could not, because there may be a time where you and I could suffer like that, and I think that we could be happy to do so. But Jesus, under the strength of his nature, goes alone and now will suffer at the hands of the chief priests. Isn't it something that our Jesus, our Jesus experienced that kind of betrayal and yet was unchanged by it? That's convicting to me. I don't know about you. Do you know what that does? It, it, it makes me want to be more like Jesus. And I can't be more like Jesus by resolving myself to be like that. Don't be like Peter. Get all fired up. Be like Peter later. <laughs> Who relies on the Spirit of God to guide him. We want to be able to remain weak. Be like Paul. Boast in our weakness. Enjoy the grace of God that we have. So that we can remain on course. So that we can experience the life that God gives. Do you have the life of God? Do you have the life that Jesus died on the cross that you may receive? If you don't have that life, my friend, you're fooling yourself. You're not a Judas. I would never say that about anybody. Nobody gets to be as bad as Judas. Judas wasn't fooling himself. He wasn't fooling God either. Maybe you think you're fooling some people. It's not any malicious reason. Maybe you just think you're able to fool people. Live a double life. God sees all that. He sees it all. He sees it all, and just like God does, He loves you anyway. He showed His love for you. He showed His love for you. And you can either be broken by that love, or one day you're going to face him in your rebellion, and you'll be crushed to bits. This is our God. The wrath that Jesus took on the cross was so powerful. None of us, none of us could ever dream of what he experienced. And we're going to focus some more on that in the weeks to come. But remember this, be encouraged by this. Because Christ endured the cross, we can have a life to endure anything that this world can throw at us. Anything. So let's continue to watch and to pray. Let's pray. Lord, what you experienced through betrayal, Some of us can relate to. Some of us have been betrayed. Some of us have felt that sting of betrayal, and it hurts so bad. It's confusing when someone close to us hurts us. But I would say very few of us have experienced that, but maybe some have here. Lord, I pray that if anyone has experienced that kind of betrayal and they have been knocked off course by it, Lord, that they begin to simply trust that you can give them the power, the desire, 
to walk as you walked, with your power, not their power, by your spirit, not their flesh. And Lord, we want to thank you because we remember these things. We want to thank you for your grace toward us, for saving us, because we were your enemies at one point, and you died for us, your enemies. Lord, help us to love our enemies, to remember that vengeance belongs to you. It doesn't belong to us. It's not ours. Not if we're yours. And strengthen us by your spirit to do so, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing one more.